first of all, thank you all for coming today, and thank you for the interest in our event today. Um, I saw many new faces today. First of all, we have to apologize for the arrangement today. We didn't expect there would be so many people. So please feel free to make yourself comfortable. If you want to lie down, it doesn't matter. So make yourself feel comfortable. So, for those of you who are new to Balcony Salon, let me introduce myself first. My name is Winnie. I'm the co-founder of Balcony Salon. And also let me introduce my partner, Yubi. Um, this is the platform we founded in March this year. And she will give her more detailed introduction about the organization later. Um, a bit more about the rundown for today. So we will have a talk about one hour and a half. And after that, we will have 30 minutes for Q&A session. So if you have any question about startups or any question you feel you want to ask the speakers, please feel free to do so. And after that, we will divide into small sections and you can feel free to join any section. Um, without further delay, let me pass to the speakers for them to give a short introduction about themselves and also about their businesses. Should we start from Rose? Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, it's a big one. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Ross. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Showbox. Uh, I've been uh, working for uh, as a buy side analyst for about three years, uh, but recently I decided to quit and start my own business. So, um, I was focusing on the internet uh, research and investment. So, uh, now I become an internet participant instead of an uh, internet investor. So, before I start, can I just do a quick survey that? And how many of you have heard Showbox? Could you please raise your hand? Oh, great, great. I'm happy. And how many of you know today's event because of Showbox? Could you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, that's one over there. Okay, so uh, that means I uh, should work harder to promote our products because we just launched three weeks ago. So uh, before I start, uh, let's just watch a short video uh, about Showbox. So make sure everybody knows what we're doing right now. How many times do you think you unlock your phone every day? What if you get paid every time you unlock it? Introducing Showbox. Showbox is the first app in Hong Kong that pays you for simply unlocking your phone. Showbox presents new products, latest events, popular apps, and hottest promotions on your lock screen. With a simple swipe, you can choose to engage these offers or skip them. Unlock your phone as usual. Either way, you get paid. Showbox learns from your every swipe what you like, so it can show you what you want. Or you can simply like our ads. You can earn Showbox points and use them to review cool stuff in our gift store, get gift vouchers, donate to charity, or simply cash out via PayPal. You can earn more points by telling your friends and getting them to sign up with your personal referral code. Get Showbox at www.showbox.com.hk. Go ahead, unlock some surprises. Nice. Thank you. Uh, so we understand what we're doing now. So I think everybody agrees that uh, internet changed our lives. Uh, we're spending more time on mobile phone uh, than we spend with our family or friends. Now we are used to check emails, uh, read news, or check friends update on mobile. Um, even we sleep with our smartphone and wake up with it. <laughs> so uh, the emerging uh, uh, time span uh, with mobile brings a lot of new business opportunities. Uh, say exa for example, mobile advertising is one of them that uh, we captured. Uh, if you use Open Rise or Hong Kong Movie, you probably figure out that they are all trying to monetize that app by placing the pop-up or banner ads inside. So personally, I hate it because uh, whenever I log in Overrise, I try to search a restaurant, there's a pop-up, and you, usually you just click the ads by mistake, you redirect it to somewhere else. So you have to do it all over again. again. So then I and my team started to think, uh, if there's a better place that we can place information, advertisement on mobile, that give users a much better experience uh, that's how we started. I'm not sure if you uh, realize yourself how many times you unlock your phone uh, lock screen every day. Have you any idea how many times? 
No. 50. According to Showbox data, uh, the average number used to unlock the smartphone a lock screen is over 60. So it's a huge number. Uh, probably we don't have a, we haven't realized yet, but it's happening around us. So we think that uh, the lock screen is uh, it's the best place that to deliver information and to place advertisement. Uh, that's how we get started. So usually when you think you have a brilliant idea, you can beat the world, then you, uh, before you kick off, you think everything is big and brilliant. Uh, so you're gonna, you're gonna imagine that, uh, okay, I'm gonna stay with my partners all day long, uh, debating on what cool functions should be integrated into your product, uh, or how to realize, how to implement these functions by um, using the latest, coolest technology or, or tricks. Then you think, you imagine you got a lot of users, venture capitals to help you expand your business quickly around the world, and you become famous. You, got, uh, you change the user's habit, you change the world. But in reality, this kind of imagination really happens. Uh, uh, it's totally different. So from my experience, uh, when you register a company, uh, you get started, uh, you're, always stuck, you're always trapped by the small things and tedious things. Say, um, users' complaints where they're not receiving showbox points, um, they cannot log in, uh, crash, uh, rental, you have to pay rentals, bank account got some problem. Uh, all these small things, you got frustrated. And you think you should spend more time doing more meaningful things, um, doing great things, but you just cannot fix all these small things in time and do it well. Then you think about it, uh, what's more meaningful? It said, is it think big or Start small. I think um, smart people are all around us. Everybody's smart. Uh, this, uh, the world is not lack of great ideas. I think everybody got ideas. But the really the important for I think the important things for, for, for us to is to execute, is to put your uh, idea into real practice. That's smart people, what smart people do. To be an entrepreneur, you have to be um, be two roles in, at one time. One is general and soldier. You have to think great and you have to clean shit. That's what entrepreneurs do. So I think for um, execution is the uh, most important success factor. Um, if you really have a great idea, you think it's gonna work, uh, my advice is just quit your full-time job and start right now <laughs> before everybody get it done. That's my suggestion, thank you. Um, I guess the audience might have many more questions to ask you later. Maybe should we pass to Mark first and let him to give a short introduction about himself? Um, hi, my name is Mark. Um, I'm talking about quitting jobs and starting small. I have uh, more you know, ground rule about that. And uh, I'm going to share with you actually how I quit my job and start small. Um, just well, let me try this if this works because my slides is kind of complicated. Give me one second. Hopefully. Oh, thank God. All right. The title is how to reduce 90% of your workload without losing income. <laughs> Very salesy, huh? <laughs> if I price a $100,000 product here, you probably buy it, but I won't. Um, okay. So I'm going to share with you three stages of my life in the past six years, basically. I start very low, lower than a lot of you. Uh, it's a normal job with a normal workload. So on the left hand side, that's the income, and on the right hand side, that's workload. That's what pretty much an office clerk do. And then I got into finance, which I got more income, but I work hell more. <laughs> and, um, and now I'm at this stage, which is a um, similar kind of income, but I don't really work. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> All right, so stage one, very quickly, very uh, boring fact. My first job is engineer, um, analyst, sort of. Um, I have a um, technical issue here. <laughs> All right, got it. Okay, I have a 15k month uh, monthly income salary, so that's an average um, uh, salary for uh, Hong Kong graduates. And uh, the hour is 96. Uh, average number for there. If you do the calculation, I earn about 100 Hong Kong dollars per hour. Fair, huh? All right, problem. 
is that um, not satisfied really. Okay. Um, there's a, it's a quite big organization. It's about um, uh, it's about industrial engineering, uh, which I know some of you are. Um, it's about changing the world to a more efficient place. But uh, if you are in a big uh, organization, it rarely happens. And, and also, it's a kind of fixed position. I don't really have a career, uh, I mean, a career ladder to climb, so I cannot see myself earn a lot of mon money uh, for the years to come. And it's in an industry that I'm not, in, in fact, so interested. I will not see myself uh, open up a similar uh, company myself in the future time. So, solution for that problem is that, can I get a better job with a better payment? So I think about, okay, in Hong Kong, what should we do? <laughs> Right, finance, right? Um, and with my engineering background, what can I do? CFA, right? So, um, actually, this is the fun part. So, in the spring of 2008, I um, I graduated from uh, HKUST. So, I stay there in my spare time, just crash the CFA notes, um, and then on the side, I discover something that is very, very valuable to me. I'm sure most of you have heard the name. That is rich dad, poor dad. Most of you probably heard the name, but um, I really implemented it. I love, I, I love the cash flow game, by the way. If you have the chance to play, I will suggest you to let it wash your mind. And so even, even before my CFA exams in that summer, I have a side product, which, oh, sorry, did I jump? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, jumping back to um, two most important things I learned. One is the uh, principle in corporate finance, is that basically all the business in the world we are doing we're doing <laughs> clicking. Um, it, this is not good contrast, but we're trying to find low-cost resource and then trying to use that to invest in higher projects. Basically, everybody is doing this. Um, they, they did it in a fancy way of uh, uh, MPV or IRR uh, formulas. You probably know that. And then as personal financial freedom, uh, what uh, Robert told us is that this is one passive income is more than your expense. Passive income is the income that you don't have to work for. It's like rental. Uh, if you didn't spend any time, you'll still come. So when that is more than your expense, you basically don't have to work. You can do whatever you want, be whenever you want, right? And then that's when in the cash flow game, we call it get out of the rat race. So I want that, basically. Um, and there's a side product before my um, examination is that I started investing in the Hong Kong property. I suddenly realized that it's such a good point to enter the market. Um, <laughs> I s for my first, first thing, I spent less than 100K down, uh, so 20, 20 times leverage, because they allow you to do that at that time. Uh, my net passive income is uh, 1,700. Uh, if you do the calculation, it's about over 20% cash on cash return. So that's pretty good, huh? Um, and and also, I have other things in my life that I monetized. Um, I monetized two, two of my hobbies. Uh, one hobby is uh, piano. Um, I learned piano from a very young age and I started teaching in 06. It's a uh, one-on-one teaching, uh, meaning that I would give private coaching, basically. Uh, depends on your level, I earn about 200 to 400 an hour. Uh, 400 is when you are level eight or something. Um, I do have to travel to my students' place, and I do have to, you know, commit a fixed time every week to do that. And the other thing is more fun is uh, salsa dancing. <laughs> I earned this. I learned. I, I learned salsa dancing start from 05, and then I uh, start from uh, 09. I start teaching. It's a big class, one too many. So it depends on how many people come. I can earn from 200 to 800. Well, sometimes I lose money because nobody comes. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's uh, more, more, more beneficial, more uh, risk kind of thing. But I do have to organize students uh, because once in uh, maybe two months, they will just go and I need to find some new ones come in. So it's not that stable. So now that I have so many stuff, I try to put that into several matrix. Okay, so in order to improve your life, basically I would like to earn more per hour so that I can actually reach the same amount of money without uh, working so much. And also I want, on the left hand side, there's flexible and stable because uh, if it is flexible out working hours, you can just you know, feel, feel relaxed and you can do at your own pace. And if it's stable, then you, ha you don't have to you know, always kind of uh, looking for new uh, opportunities of income. So I put that four things in. Um, for my first job, 
is uh, 100 uh, an hour. Uh, flexibility uh, and stability, I give you two and three stars. Uh, later, you will have a comparison, so you know why I put two and three stars there. So on the far end side, I have passive income. Well, it's passive, so I don't spend time. So theoretically, it, well, technically, it should be infinite, right? Uh, but I just <laughs> give a very large number there. You know the idea. But for flexibility and stability, it's really good. For flexibility, because I don't have to you know, be there. Uh, it's always coming. Um, stable as uh, I own an asset, right? So I, I don't foresee my, my salary, I mean, my rent to just go to zero. Um, and in the middle, we have piano and dancing. Um, it earns a little bit more than my first job um, by, by hour. Um, Flexible-wise, it's a bit more flexible, but I still have to commit a time uh, every week. Uh, Stable-wise, for piano, it's, uh, you know, if you know piano, that people usually learn a lot of years in consequence. So when I have a student, I fire them, they don't fire me. Um, for dancing, it's always changing. So that's the other end of a uh, uh, spectrum there. So it's very unstable. I just gave one star there. So let's see what's next. All right. Um, OK. So but for the previous slide, I, I need to say something that, of course, I want more passive income, right? It's the obvious, the best income available as personalized. Um, but it's hard. And I, I soon reach the end of my property investing, which is the second one. Uh, that's the December of 2009. I buy a tiny, tiny, small apartment in Hong Kong. It's, uh, the total price is only 880K. So, but I need to spend 30% down. So that's 24, uh, 240K. But uh, the net passive income is around 2,000 something. It's about uh, more than 10% cash on cash. And then I realized, even though uh, you can find such a small apartment uh, here to invest, you still have to come up with 240K in the initial investment, right? There's no point I can get that with my 15K monthly salary. Um, and this route, although it's really good, that is not a, you know, it's not something that you can just work hard and get it. And for this, I have a little project called Landlord Together. I built a web app for that so that people can, you know, get their money to, uh, to, to do that. I can talk about that later uh, if you guys are interested. So put, um, so from here, going back from here, I need to expand, right? So I was thinking, how can I improve? So whether I get a better job on the left-hand side, or can I find something over there, you know, to have a better, you know, uh, uh, income per hour? From the slides, so you probably know that I have both, right? But you will, be, you will come later. Um, okay, so here's the key thing, the internet marketing stuff. This is what we are talking about in this uh, presentation. So for internet marketing or internet related to anything, um, the good thing is that just the setup cost is so low. Basically, I only have one laptop. That's it. All right, one laptop. I don't have an office. I, I go to Starbucks. Um, I come to my client's place. So I travel around. Uh, so I don't really have a you know, rental uh, fixed cost or something. And it's also a very current trend of uh, using internet to change the world. Basically, you can think of almost everything that is related to either inf information or system or the way people interact. You can always find something to, to do new things with, uh, with that. And I started with uh, uh, 2008, just learning the basics. I try a lot of stuffs, uh, CPA, affiliate, SEO blogging. This is technical terms, but I can show you if you are interested. And I also build some social platforms for my sales parties, and I have built personal tools. Well, one is called My Scoreboard, which is uh, designed for tracking CFA rating progress, <laughs> <laughs> which my friends like, actually. Um, and then the other one is Landlord Together, which I only use for myself at the moment, but it actually can open to the world. Um, I spent over uh, 100K Hong Kong dollars in tuition, uh, either on training materials that I purchased from the United States, or I invest something just to try things out and lose. So that's way more expensive than any of my degrees earned so far. But it's uh, less expensive than MBA, right? <laughs> But luckily, I have, uh, I have a key moment um, soon down the road. In, in the summer of 2010, this is when Google have done some change. If, if you search at local terms like restaurant and dry cleaning place, you will, you will see the local um, businesses pop up in the Google first, uh, first screen, right? So 
Google is doing this, suddenly a lot of opportunities are available for the local businesses to do their business. So, I yeah. So um, I I obviously know about this, and then I land my first client, which is a friend. I help them for free at the beginning, so there's no term that she will just turn me down. Um, but after six months, my result is so good, and uh, the business owner said I should pay you. So, uh, and then that's my first paid client in uh, February 2011. So income potential for this part, that's interesting, huh? Benefit for internet and software industry is that a lot. Um, first, there's a lot of automation that can be done. I mean, there's a lot of you know office clerk work. If you can systemize it. Write, write down the process, then everything can be optimized uh, for that. And there's a lot of copy and paste. If you understand the underlying structure uh, of the engineering part of internet, then you don't have to read well the will. And there's a lot of people you can learn from. So because my you know optimized setup, my income for the um, internet marketing service is, should I click? Okay, it's over a thousand Hong Kong dollars per hour. And it's very flexible because I don't have to go to work. And I think it's at least three star uh, stable compared to my first job. So, okay, we, we sort of have a winner there. And on the sec, well, on the other side, I do have a second job. At uh, uh, October 2010, I got into equity research uh, introduced by my friend. Um, and because at that time, I already passed CFA level two. So it's in uh, exchange fair. And the uh, salary is not that good. It's 25K, which is a lot lower than a lot of yours. Um, but it's 66% increase from my previous one. 66% <laughs> increase in salary equals to about three times increase in my saving, which is a lot, which is significant a lot. Um, but again, I need to clock in longer hours, more than 12 per day. And then if you do a calculation, it's actually a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a mixed feeling, right? Because did I get into this job because I improved my life or not? Um, so that's my stage too, right? I have more income, I have even more workload. Just the, the, my second job is an opportunity for me to work over time, basically, earning the similar rate. So if you put that into a perspective here, I give it at here, financial starter uh, salary, <laughs> like that, right? Uh, flexibility and stability dropping down from my first job. <laughs> Although I do earn a more money um, every month. So it changed my life for sure. First, I quit these two things. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot imagine a salsa dancer, I mean, salsa teacher is working in finance, right? <laughs> Nobody does that. And then my internet business, because I don't really have the time, um, it's really slow, to be honest. Um, I don't have any clients for an entire year after my first time client. So you, you basically just stuck there. So, and then I also think about if I'm successful um, in finance, maybe I could earn about 100K per month, well, conservatively speaking, in a few years. Not be, well, this is not that conservative, actually. Um, so if you do the calculation, 10 hours a day, 20 days a month, I think that's good hours for uh, finance, right? Um, you will get about a little bit less than 500 hour, uh, Hong Kong dollars per hour. Um, well, I don't really have the opportunity to earn any bonus, so I don't add that in. Um, if you put that into the perspective here, we have here. Okay, so here is what my life choice is. So if you're facing this, this chart, right, where would you go? For me, decision is simple. I will go to internet business, and I, if I have the extra cash, I will invest in the passive income. Right, pretty straightforward, right? Um, the numbers speak itself. So my strategy is to play safe, actually, at, at the beginning, which I a little bit uh, regret at the moment. So I don't want to quit my job until my side businesses, uh, all the income of my, the other income streams have replaced my salary so that I don't have to lower my standard of living. But that never happens. It's very difficult. So um, uh, I don't suggest you to do that if you do have a 12 hour working job. Um, okay, this is a bit tricky. 
I'm reviewing a lot of my dirty, dirty stuff here, huh? All right, so this is, if you cannot see it clearly, this is my monthly income chart. Um, the black one in the background is my job, is my salary. Uh, the little bars down below is my different kind of uh, resource. Um, I will come back to this because I, I need to explain some details. So at the beginning of November 07, I was earning 15K, right? So it's the same until October 2010, I reached to the other level. So at the beginning, I was doing some salsa teaching, dancing, uh, piano stuff and there. And now I have to invest some properties, there's some passive income, on and on. And then there in the February 11, I began to have this in internet stuff, right? So it's being up and down. But within my, within, within my time of actually having a job, I never really reached that point that my other income add up is beyond uh, my salary. So I didn't actually quit. Another key moment comes, which helped me, is the let go day of uh, <laughs> July 20th, 2012. My boss just said, I'm sorry, we have to let you go. I was shocked, <laughs> but <laughs> first moment is shocked, God. Second moment is yes. <laughs> because I feel bad if I have to bring up the question that, so sorry, I want to quit. After two years of teaching me, I want to quit the industry. I feel bad to my, you know, to the friends that introduced me to the, um, to the company. But to be, to, to be true, then that's the dark days. When the dark days start to happen, you're leaving off your salary uh, savings from previous years. It drops really quick because I have an apartment in Central. Um, and, but for the internet business part, it's booming. It's booming. Um, I will review the rest of the, the graph, which is like that. Okay. The frequency of getting new clients before, when I have a job, is like, like two clients. There. But afterwards, it's like that. Right? So I get a lot of more clients because I'm able to promote myself freely. I talk to my friends that I'm doing this right now. So if I have any friends, you can just refer to me. We can start talking. Uh, by doing into that, by getting into that mode, I actually start earning a lot of exposure. And people treat me seriously on that kind of job. Uh, I do have some loss there as well. And this is my roughly portfolio. I got a lot. If you go to my website, it's called getmorebizonline.com. There's a click the cases and you can see all my portfolio work. I will update it uh, once in a while. And yet, there's another key moment, which already show in the graph, is my salary replacement date. <laughs> it's May the 20th, 2013, which is 10 months after my let go day. <laughs> ah, there, 10 months after my let go day. Uh, okay, right, so so that, that's my stage through right now, right? Okay, so my, my stage, stage three um, income uh, is, can be divided into this. I got about 60% in my internet marketing service business, and then another 40% is the passive income I accumulated over the years through uh, investing different kind of stuff. Um, I get over 25K right now. Um, I, for that 25K, I spent less than 20 hours a month. So that's like four hour work week, right? If you know the name of that book. <laughs> Actually, a little bit less than that. So. so what do I do for the rest of my day? I want to quote the back on this little slogan. I like it a lot. I basically share, inspire, connect with the other people. I talk to different kind of people about what, am I, what I'm doing, why am I doing this, how can, I, how can my service help them, how can my knowledge serve help them, I help them for free, I help them they pay me, all kind of stuff. Um, and I connect with a lot of people. I connect with a lot of uh, business owners, which is kind of fun, actually. Um, and then I'm looking for more opportunities with that time. And actually, also inspired by the Bob this loans, uh, this event, actually, I, I gather all the knowledge, in, sorry, not knowledge, all the data and my past history, I just to sum it up. I decided to, I think that this is an interesting story, so I want to try to write a blog about this. So I opened up a blog, it's called Salary Replacement. If you go to salaryreplacement.com, you can see the blog, which is empty at the moment. But there's a Facebook, there's a Facebook like on there. You can just like it. Uh, or you can scan that QR code. Um, uh, the reason 
that I want you to like it is that if you ever want to know the details, like what exactly am I doing, how I learn all those stuff, what's the, uh, for example, how I hire my virtual assistant, something like that, uh, you can talk to me, I will share with you on that platform for free. Uh, hopefully this will inspire you to do something by yourself as well. All right, thank you. much for the very interesting salary replacement story. So that's pass to Bao Chang, and he will leave us a talk about his business in Hong Kong. Sure. I'm actually uh, happy and unhappy that I'm the third person, because um, obviously Mark's presentation is really difficult to pop, so you know, no expectations. But I also find that uh, what I'm going to talk about has a lot uh, of overlap and similarities with follows on from what Mark talked about. But before that, I just want to say thank you to uh, Winnie and uh, Yubing and Samantha for making this happen. I think it's a great opportunity. And I think there's a lot to be learned here um, from everyone. Um, so if you remember Mark's chart, he had this kind of per hour rate, and his first job was like this. And I, I, I was like, like somewhere here. Because <laughs> uh, I was an investment banker. Uh, next slide. Right, so I was doing this uh, a lot. And sometimes in, in the toilets and you know. Uh, I was in I was in JP Morgan for three and a half years and then after I made associates I went to KKR which uh, which is one of the world's largest private equity firm. So I was been working in finance for six years. And um, I think I mean the per hour rate is is not so good but the money was alright. So I, I guess I, I stuck there. Um, but towards the end of the six years, um, I felt that I just didn't want to kind of do this anymore, you know. Um, and I also felt like there was a lack of meaning in what I was doing. Or rather, I felt a need to convince myself that I was doing something meaningful. And I tried to figure out, you know, how to do that during, during this time. And um, I, I invested in like a DVD store and I tried some other things. Um, but in the end, I, I, I didn't really figure out anything except that if I was continuing my daytime job, I was not going to find the answer. So 2010, uh, October 31st, I left my uh, six years of finance job. And I'm, at the time of quitting, I didn't know I was going to do entrepreneurship, or I was going to do finance, or I was going to do anything. I just thought, like, hey, I'm just getting out of here. Uh, on the 1st of September, which is the day after I quit, I took a plane and went to the Philippines. That was right after the hostage situation. And I was welcomed, <laughs> I was welcomed by the tourist uh, organization or government of the Philippines and on the airport. Uh, there was a sign-up sheet. I was the only person from Hong Kong. <laughs> they were like, oh, welcome. Uh, you know, why are you here? Uh, it's a job, you know. Kind of uh, um, I did a lot of traveling during that time um, because you know, I, I, was, I was so searching. I was reading a lot. I was trying to figure out the next stage of my life. Um, and that, I think, helped a lot because when you go to places like this, this is northern Chile, um, the driest place on the planet. And uh, I was cycling with my friend from university who also quit his job after seven years with J.P. Morgan London. So we spent a lot of time kind of just, <laughs> just talking to each other, you know. Oh, man, I'm so happy I'm not doing banking anymore. And then, um, this, is, this place is special because there was no, uh, because it was so dry, there was no living thing at all. Like, there was no bugs, no birds, no, no flies. We went camping and there was just nothing. Like, um, you know, you, don't, you have these annoyances in Hong Kong when you go camping, but not, not in this place. Like, there's, there's nothing. Um, I think you get to talk to yourself a lot um, when there's kind of nothing around. <laughs> and then you start thinking about life and about, um, you know, the future. And um, one thing that from talking to my friend that we figured was that we both studied engineering back then, electronic engineering and information science. And then we wanted to build, a, build something new. We wanted to be creative. We wanted to build something, bring to the world, and leverage our uh, capabilities. And I think the internet startup was a natural thing to do at the time. Um, so I think that the perspective is different from Ross and from Mark. I think they, they had a very clear business model in mind, or, or at least Ross was. And Mark's perspective was settlement replacement, whereas what we thought is just, hey, we want to bring something new to the world. We want to solve a problem. We didn't really think about you know, the money aspect of it, which is why I'm still in, in Mark's world, the dark page, where I live off my savings. But, um, <laughs> so um, 
when I was 2000, 2010, I quit my job after two years of kind of doing nothing and traveling and reading. Uh, I talked to my friend, it's like, so it's been two years, right? So maybe if we want to do something, we've got to get serious. And then the only way to get serious, we thought, was to actually lock ourselves in a room and then just brainstorm business ideas. Um, so we, we decided to kind of leave Hong Kong, leave kind of people who know us and people who kind of WhatsApp us and things. Uh, we, we, we locked ourselves in this, uh, in this small flat in suburban Tokyo for one month. And then we spent six days of the week just not leaving, not leaving the room at all. We uh, just, every morning we get, get up, we would sit down to laptops, and then we would write things on the whiteboard about what we think the world should be and uh, how we can help to change it. So we had these lists of things that we thought, hey man, it would be cool to have this kind of, uh, happening in the world. And then, and then we'll go to Google and then say, hey, has anyone done this? And then maybe the first day we'll be like, no one's, no one's doing it, we should do it. And then the next day, no one's doing it. And then maybe on the fourth day or fifth day, there will be like an app moment where we'll, and then, you know, someone's done it. And then we'll go out and, uh, <laughs> and then we'll go out and go running around this, uh, the, the, this small, small place. And then just, all uh, right, let's start again. Um, so it was, it was during April, and then it was the poor season. We cooked six days of the week, and then we ate out on Sunday. This was my room at the time. It was very simple, it was my desk. Um, at the end of the month, we came up with two ideas. And then um, this is one of them which we're focused on, it's called Impromptu. And because we are of our banking background, um, we felt that there was a need for last minute social planning for busy professionals in Hong Kong, especially bankers and lawyers and people working finance. Uh, impromptu is an English word uh, with a TU at the end, which means last minute like impromptu speech like what I'm doing right now. And um, there's, um, and so, so like at seven o'clock, if you find yourself suddenly free, you know, you finish a conference call and you want to find people to hang out with, and it can be dinner, drinks, or whatever. Or it could be weekend activities, for example, this, this, this gathering here was also organized on this platform. Um, we want to build something that help people better socialize and focus on offline, face-to-face. -face. So we, we, we think that there's not a lot, not, not enough face-to-face -face interactions happening. Um, so we, we build this platform, uh, it's been a year or so that we've been working on it. We didn't outsource, so everything was done from scratch. Um, I, I picked up programming after six years of finance, and it was, it was fun. Uh, so we applied for a Hong Kong incubation program, which is a disciple-poor incubation program. Hong Kong has two government-sponsored incubation programs, and they gave you free office, and they gave you a amount of money that you can reimburse against. So the disciple-poor one, uh, gave you this, this, this office. I mean, it has no window, but it's all right. Um, <laughs> we pay nothing on rent, but we do pay two to three thousand dollars a month on management fees. Uh, it's okay uh, for uh, for for an office of this size, I think. And um, there's a three hundred thousand grant which you can reimburse. So, for example, Tiffany is our full-time employee, and we're paying her salary. She's a fresh graduate from Chinese University of Hong Kong. And then half of her salary every month is reimbursed by the Subaport program. So that helps us a lot. And then that's our intern um, from the Baptist University. There's me and my co-founder. There's Eva, our, um, <laughs> our helper. And then there's, uh, <laughs> oh, actually, she's a, she's a caretaker of the chairman of our company who is uh, this hat, right, at the back. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, that's the um, yeah, so I just want to summarize. I think uh, when I was in banking, I was really just working. Uh, not really to work to live, just, just work. And then, <laughs> and then I quit to kind of ponder about what was going on. And then now I kind of um, I find this passion that I want to you know, live to work. Um, so to finish off, I want to share a, a comic with you last night. Last <laughs> yeah, it's, it's someone talking to uh, Super Mario. Mario is actually a plumber. He, he, so he, Mario is a plumber, and he said, the fame is fine, the money is great, but sometimes I miss the plumbing. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, I, think um, I don't know, how many of you are in finance or kind of finance related? 
right? So I think you probably agree with the first two parts, and then at least for, for me, I, I, I really feel this, the last part. Like I felt like there was something missing, so I tried to find it. Uh, I just want to share with you at the end a very short video about our products. And if you are interested in working in the industry, you can scan there's a QR code at the back that right? so you can click on the window, and then you can register on our platform. We are open for private beta testing right now. Thank you. Just let me introduce myself in short. Um, my name is Frank. I studied Drupal E during the uni. And um, after I graduated, I went to UBS in London um, as a technology analyst. And I worked there for about a year and resigned, came back to Hong Kong. And then I uh, worked in a few companies as a programmer. So um, some people might ask that, um, why did I resign so early? Um, you know, have a good start. And my answer to that is, um, I wanted some changes. And I believe in this room, many of you, you know, share the same feelings sometimes. You know, um, perhaps you feel like, you know, you can do better than your current job, and get better paid. And maybe you feel bored about, you know, doing things that you are being told to. And um, maybe life and work doesn't quite balance, right? So um, all this does motivate me to start my first entrepreneurship. Um, just let me introduce my product with a video. Um, yeah. Uh, the video. Uh, <laughs> 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 so now you've got a restaurant. You have welcomed your waiters aplenty, while staff in situ, and here come your eager clients. The front of hungry customers order your yummy food non stop. But by nightfall, the welcoming waiters grow tired and weary. Then your accountant's books become unbalanced, costing you hundreds of dollars. The cook misses two important orders, and you've got five irate customers offering to write bad reviews about you on Twitter. So you sit there sad and troubled, not knowing what to do. And here we come to help you with a smart solution good for you. We present you with Smart Order, an automated ordering system. The client makes an order from a table tablet or their own iPad. The order goes directly to the cook's computer, the accountant's books, and the manager's log. The waiters are happy because it saves their legs. Your customers are happy to tell their Twitter friends what a great service you provide. And you are happy because it saves you bundles of money, since the cost of the program start from only $60 per month with no prepayment. It's called Smart Order. Sounds good, doesn't it? Smart Order. Order it smart. Um, thanks for watching. I think all of you get the idea. Um, so our company provides um, automation software to restaurants. So um, to be honest, this is not a very um, new idea. So why is it not in the market for so many years? Um, I think the reason for that is probably the cost that um, you know, we require to invest in the hardware and also um, to maintain the software. So um, a very good practice that most 
venture capital recommend, I think it's really useful, is to build up your business model first. Um, a business model as your um, input and output, um, input as your revenue, output as your cost. So, um, and before, well, really, um, in order for your business to survive, you, you know, have to fit in this model. Um, so, during the development of the process, uh, we try to automate um, most of our operations as possible. So, um, for the system itself, um, after development, the only cost for the, um, to maintain the operation will be only the computer server that is um, rendered in Germany and also um, some, a little bit of administration support. So um, how user is going to, you know, if they watch our video and, you know, read our website and be interested, what they have to do is just um, click on the link in our website, um, then do a payment by credit card, and um, the system will automatically activate the account for them. So um, here's the uh, management console for them. So what they have to do is just, um, you know, configure um, their restaurant setting, like um, printer, staff members, and uh, menus, and modifier. And for some advanced user, they can be using the um, inventory management system. And at the end of the day, um, they can also, um, you know, read the end of day report, you know, the sales report. So, um, and I got two tablets here that um, for people who are interested, you know, you can have a look on the software after the presentation. Um, so, um, in, so I hope my story, you know, maybe can encourage you or maybe uh, motivate you to start a, try a startup. Because um, I think that um, the regret that for something you do um, is ten, can be tempered by time, and the regret for something you did not do is um, inconsolable. So um, if you have any idea that you want to try, I think you should just you know, go ahead and start it. Otherwise, you know, if you didn't do it, you will be regretted. Yes. And uh, thanks for listening. Yes. So um, our basic running uh, idea is to make money just to uh, support the operation of the business, which we haven't found a way to make money yet, but we sure we will at some point. Um, I copy this chat here is because the idea of Balcony Saloon was born on a boring weekday afternoon on a rumor chat. So I was talking to several friends um, outside of work about uh, what we do on weekends. And then a friend called Sophia suggested, she said she wants to organize some sort of intellectual group where um, a group of people gather on weekends and then talk about it, discuss about the topic that the host proposed every time. I said, Jesus, this is what I've been trying to do for two years, and I haven't started, so let's get it started. And uh, Sophia didn't really follow up on that, so I started on my own. <laughs> um, uh, but the, uh, the idea was, because I think Hong Kong lacks a kind of um, intellectual social platform in which people can really talk to others about their interests and passion. I've been to numerous drinking events in Hong Kong, and there, when you meet a new friend, everyone is tagged by which firm he's from, uh, age probably, uh, position, and uh, which country or where in Hong Kong you live. And then after the drinking events, you come back with a, a, a pack of name cards and you think, is it really what I want to know about my new friends? Just a few tags. But actually, I think everyone here and everyone in Hong Kong is a hundred times more interesting than just a few texts. And I want to create a platform for everyone to have the chance to stand up here, share their passion, or sit there and listen to the other side of your friends. The idea is good, and a lot of people support me, but the execution is much, much more difficult than I thought. The first speaker took me a long time to find, and I couldn't find it, so I decided to do it myself. Uh, so I delivered the first speech, which is on Chinese ceramics, and uh, it's it's quite successful in a way that quite many people came, and the feedback was good. Um, so that's the picture we took after the uh, speech. Twenty something there. Every single one of them are my close friends, and I <laughs> I called, texted, uh, Facebook messaged, literally forced them to come to the. <laughs> to the speech. And look now, we have, uh, I don't know, roughly 100 people here, and we actually are worried about how to reject people 
uh, without you know being so in flat. So it's it's a huge progress from that first session to now. And I want to share a few milestones about the half year about Moodle's form. The first one is the first session, of course. And then in May, Winnie joined me as a partner. Winnie was my second speaker, which is uh, about classic music, and in the start of May. And then she was inspired, and she decided to join me as a partner of the Balcony Saloon. And um, also in May, we received the first speaker application, because usually we have to come go out and search for speakers. But in May, someone actually approached me and said she's interested in giving a performance. And that's the classical concert that we also held here uh, in May. And we attracted, uh, attracted an audience of something like 19. It was really successful. And then in June, the registered member, the register, I can go back. Yeah. The registered members reached uh, 300 from just 20 in, in the beginning. So that was quite something to me. And then in October, we held a summer rock concert which has a record audience yeah. of 250. I think it's not that easy to hold events of 250 in Hong Kong. And we, we ran the whole club, and it was a fantastic night, according to a lot of people that came. And in November, which is now, we got the first media coverage from Phoenix U Radio, which is right here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I believe that Walking from here, we still have a lot of new milestones to make. And for those who are not familiar with Balcony Salon or who haven't attended the events before, I have a small video where I can show you some of the video clips of the past events. The, uh, it was a sad love story uh, to <laughs> find a team. Yeah, seriously. Because uh, one, one of my friends, uh, a friend, actually, I, I didn't know him quite well. Um, he was uh, just one year, one grade, uh, one year older uh, than me. 
uh, we, we graduated from the same university, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, then uh, we play soccer sometime, but I haven't talked to him. Like I never talked to him because I, I thought he was a nerd. Uh, uh, but then once uh, I saw his uh, Facebook update, oh no, it's a WeChat update, saying that uh, some Hong Kong people they are not willing to take risks and try uh, ideas. So I asked why, um, because I, I thought I should make some change um, to quit job, find, find something interesting, do my, doing myself. Then I asked him, uh, what are we doing? Uh, he said, uh, he got an idea uh, and uh, wanted to start the idea with somebody, uh, some Hong Kong people. Uh, then they quit because uh, they, they didn't want to give the current job the cap stable cash flow. So then I met, met, met him up uh, and uh, he said he, he's got an idea from Korea, a girl that he met on Facebook. Uh, like, and then it was a uh, he fly to Korea and met a girl uh, and brainstorm the idea and th think uh, show box is uh, something we can do together. So it was a two day love story in Korea then uh, he come, came back and broke up. Uh, then he was sad and he needed a new team to to, to move on, to, to make this uh, uh, idea to, to a product. To, then uh, that's how, how we met. Uh, I, I was uh, researching on internet sector for about three years, so I'm quite interested in this sector. I think there's a lot of new and uh, business model there. Uh, we, uh, people can, uh, you can, you can implement your ideas uh, by codes and uh, internet, especially mobile internet. So I gave him some advice and he said, yeah, it's a good idea. And then we, we started. But the, I think the most part is uh, two people is, is not enough to develop Showbox. Uh, it's a big project. You have to a lot of front end and back end. Uh, you, have, you need an engineer team to help you to develop the product. Uh, then uh, I just then I started to ask around uh, friends. Uh, you, you know Android coding. You, you can do programming. Um, nobody responds because uh, my friends are all in finance industry. Nobody knows how to do codes. So then I start to uh, ask my friends from overseas. Uh, one of my friends in Singapore. Then I ask him, uh, Hey, uh, do you know any, fr any friends that like, can do the coding? Uh, and he responds very quickly, uh, say yes, got one. Then uh, it was uh, Wednesday, I think. Uh, he re he texted me back, saying that he found someone who can maybe do the, this kind of thing. Then I and my partner uh, Paul, actually his name is, uh, booked a ticket immediately, and we flew to Singapore uh, and just show up in, in front of them. So we we, did, we 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 spent like 24 hours during the weekends uh, brainstorm how we implement, uh, how what should we do, how we can bring these ideas to a like higher level uh, and we, we all see the potential of the product and uh, then we, we, we started on the next Monday immediately we start to design, uh, find designers, design the uh, architecture we have Skype meeting every day uh, it was like doing two jobs like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. then go home just have some dumplings with my girlfriends and then I started to work for another eight hours. It was really tough uh, because you cannot get enough sleep, uh, and you don't, you don't, you was not focusing on your full time job in the daytime. You just kept thinking about what should I do, what should I do, what should I do. So, uh, but then uh, everything uh, goes well. Uh, we started our project in May. Uh, it's about six months from now. Uh, we have launched our product like three weeks ago, and now we're gaining um, with about hundred hundred thousand uh, users at the moment. And we're planning to conduct a bigger campaign in the next uh, in this month. So we're try, still trying to finalize our product, make it more stable, uh, adding more functions into it. I think uh, it's uh, as I just said. I think execution is more important. Uh, you you, you want to find a partners. You just gonna go and try every every resources you have, uh, every people you know to ask them if they got the suitable. One. I mean surprises just came from nowhere. Uh, like the partner I've got from Singapore, I, I, I was not too familiar with him, but, but we're now we're very close brothers. So life gives you surprises. Just try and yeah, unlock some surprises, like Shobak said. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. <laughs> Thank you for the other speakers.
Ao Chang also works with a partner, right? Could you share with us a bit more about how you find your partner? Yeah, so I, I, it was very different for me. I've known my partner since 2000. Like we were roommates back in university. And as you saw from my presentation that um, I found a partner before I had the idea. Um, a lot of people have the idea first and then they start looking for partners. So it, I think there are pros and cons for each approach. Um, but the fact that you, you find a good partner first, I think reduces a lot of the friction that might happen along the way um, with, with new partners that you don't know really well. So for us, I think um, uh, you know the, the brainstorming process um, was made a lot easier and more fun to have a partner do it with you. If you sit there yourself to try to think of an idea and then find someone to do it with, I think um, it, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be uh, quite might be quite difficult. That's good to know. So like we all know, like we now know how you find your partner, how you build up your business idea. I guess many people are concerned about the financials. How, do you, how much money do you need to start a business? Can we quickly go through everyone to share with us how much money you raise to start your business? Uh, I think about, about financing, you, you need a proposal and an idea yet. I mean, there are several rounds about financing. One is angel, then you go to seed round, then you go to series A, then you go to series B, then pre-IPO and IPO. Uh, now we've got... Uh, yeah, we, 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 we applied to, we've got two fundings. One is from the Hong Kong government. Uh, we applied for the Inkyo app program. Uh, the government gives us uh, 300,000 K, Hong Kong, Hong Kong dollar. It uh, was a lot, um, because uh, we, we just need some laptop, and we don't, we don't have any assets, just salaries and marketing expenses. Then we think uh, maybe 300 K is not enough, then we go for some private investors for angel investment. Uh, then we got an uh, investment about two million, I know, two point five million Hong Kong dollar from an angel investor. So now uh, we are we we, we have like two point eight million Hong Kong dollar to start our business. Um, I think that the important thing uh, about uh, financing to get angels or angel investors is that uh, you have to be confident about yourself. You have to persuade them to believe in you. If uh, you think big, you have to give them a pie that. Hey, it's gonna grow and grow, uh, but the, the most important thing I think for investors is not ideas because ideas can change all the time. You can, I mean, we, 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 we change a lot from our original ideas already. But the team uh, is what the investor is concerned about. They have they have to meet up all, all of the teammates and see if you are the one they believe in or they think you you can do it. Uh, idea is not that important. Execution uh, and the team quality. More uh, it's the major thing they're concerned about, I think. Um, for me, about financing, I think it's actually you have to know yourself first. Because um, obviously, if you are trying to do something that you are not capable to, then you will run into you know disaster. You know you are not going to finish it anyway. So um, I think that you first have to know yourself. What is your ability that you can do? So um, for my project, I know I can you know. Well, I, I did actually try to find an investor, but you know, uh, wasn't quite lucky. So, um, but I do have some saving. So, um, what I do is I do a full-time job, and in the part-time, I hire some people from China. And how did I find them? Is actually, um, you know, from uh, Ma Ma Yun, uh, which uh, I find them from Taobao. So um, it's like eBay in China. So uh, people say, oh, I can do programming and then you know, put, put it on the um, shop. So um, I find you know, different programmer in, in the shop and then ask them to do the job. So in my case, my findings is that I do the full-time job um, in the daytime. <laughs> um, at night, I, I do the design part and then I pass it to the programmer to do the work. So um, I... I I, I know that how much it's going to cost for me, so um, that's how I plan stuff. So I think that you have to understand what is your ability and your, you know, if the project requires the resources that is over your ability, then probably you will meet investor or maybe a, you know, a wealthy uncle or maybe sugar daddy mom. You know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, yeah. First of all, I think you have to first understand yourself and start the project, manage the financing by yourself. So, um, 
Yes, um, do the planning basically for the finance part. Yes. Um, so for me, I don't really have a product compared to the three others, um, but I do plan to have one. Um, for, for my current uh, in internet marketing service point of view, I, I, just, I just invest something in education myself. So there's a lot of trial and error. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to have someone nearby to coaching me through the process saying that this is a wrong, this is a wrong route, you shouldn't go this way, this is too spammy, you shouldn't go this way. Um, so I just tried myself, uh, got spam a lot. Um, but for the future, if I have, I, I do have a um, software apps, I probably, well, I'm quite conservative in a lot of ways. Um, I will find an idea that can be found by customers. Meaning that if I can sell, if I can pre-sell, I will start building. Um, I won't, uh, otherwise I, I don't know what, what price should I price it or whether or not people actually like it or something. So that's, that's me. Uh, I think upfront investment in the sense of capex um, is almost zero. Like um, if your idea is a internet-based idea, um, then the recent development in the technology space, including Amazon Web Service and similar things, allows you to rent uh, infrastructure on the cloud on pay-as-you-go basis, which means that if you don't have a lot of visitors to your website, you don't have a lot of customers yet, then it's actually zero. Like, um, for example, what we're doing right now is just developing products and testing markets. We don't need to pay anything on, on infrastructure. Uh, the only cost that we, the upfront cost that we have is our um, opportunity cost of, of the founders. And on an ongoing basis, um, we have an employee. So I don't mind telling you that it's around 14,000 a month for a fresh graduate programmer. Half of that can be reimbursed by the government incubation program, so you will pay 7,000. And then we pay 3,000 on top of that for management fees of our office, so that's about 10,000 a month. So 10,000 Hong Kong dollars a month is about the, the burn rates that we, that we have. I mean, there's nothing much else. Um, and now all, all that at the moment comes out of our savings. We have not started trying to um, get, get investors yet, um, like Showbox. Uh, I think what we want to do is prove uh, the concept first. Um, convince ourselves first that this works, and then we try to convince uh, investors. Um, the balcony's financial statement is very simple: two items. One is the rent, and the other is uh, cupcakes. That's what we <laughs> what we provide provided in the first several sessions, and then I stopped because I realized that we have a huger, and hu uh, larger and larger audience. It's difficult for me to make ends meet. Um, the rent. Each time is roughly 500 to 1,000, and we uh, currently are using our own in income to support that. But for some of the mega events, like the rock concert, we do charge a ticket to just to cover the rent. And we are thinking about um, applying for maybe government incubation program or something in the future, sponsors, to cover the cost so that I can, we can actually provide food and drinks for everyone here, <laughs> but uh, it's still on the way. So. It seems like it's not very difficult to start a business, especially since there's no upfront cost. But then I also want to ask you, what is the most difficult part you guys have experienced since you started your own business? Does it all sound very optimistic? Is it all very encouraging? Do you have anything you feel like difficult so far? Please start with Mark or about you. Um. For me, um I'm uh, quite conservative, as I said. Um, so I, I, I try to, you know, uh, give a very low point about my expectations, and usually I usually beat my uh, my expectations. Um, as point, uh, I mean, in terms of the most difficult part of my business, um, well, while I have a salary job, obviously I don't have time. That's the thing. Um, right now. Um, is that I'm still in, 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 the cer in, in the search of a, uh, of a scalable business idea, which I, w I currently do business um, as a service, which means that as long as you want to do something, I fulfill your needs. You tell me what you want, I'll give you what you want. And I'll charge you over price. Uh, if you're happy with it, that's fine. This is, this is my business model at this moment. But later, I want to go into stage that, okay, I know that what this group wants. I can provide a standardized product like uh, Frankie's portal that you can just sign up and 
do it yourself unless you have a troubleshooting problem. So um, for me, it's in the searching of a better business model that I can scale up, I think. Yeah, so I think the difficulty maybe comes from two, two parts. The first part is um, um, I find it quite, I find myself quite anxious when I don't know what to do. Like you, you, you're quite happy when you have a lot of things to do. Like what, especially when someone, your boss or someone tell you, and you know that you, you need to do it and then you do it. I think it's just human nature. Like if you don't have too much time to think, you're actually happier. <laughs> um, the time, the, the, as soon as you come to a point where, you know, you, you've, you've done all, all you think can be done, and then you're like, well, what do I do now? There, there are many options, and then you don't know which one is the right one, and then you, I, I sometimes find myself doing it just to make myself feel less anxious. Like I would play with this existing code and optimize it, and after the end, at the end of the day, I think, hey, I've, I've done something, where it actually doesn't you know, improve anyone's life any better. So I think, I think that's one thing, um, how to deal with your, your, yourself. And the second thing is how to think about money. Because um, I, I quit three years ago, and for three years now, I've not had any income, per se, in, in, this, in the sense of salaries. So um, it's not really been a difficulty for me, because um, I, I, maybe just uh, my, my view towards money, et cetera, but I think it's something that people need to think very carefully about. And especially what Mark has talked about um, in terms of um, um, personal finances in the Rich Dad Poor Dad book and um, philosophically how you think about the importance of money. Um, I think that's more of an advice to people who are thinking about this. Like this comes up again and again when I talk to people as the biggest obstacle that people face and sometimes I ask myself questions about that as well. So you have to be comfortable financially before you make such a big commitment. Well, um, at the beginning, it's actually, um, I think the first difficulty is to find the right partner uh, where I didn't have it. And after that, uh, well, it's very hard to find, you know, sharing the same passion in a partner in, in your, you know, friend zone. So um, if you don't have it, you have to be mentally strong enough to actually, you know, do it by yourself. So um, I think this is uh, one of the very difficult parts because most people, when you know doing things that is not predictable, and you know you have no idea where you are going, and you have to be very strong to you know keep moving forward at the end of it. And the second part of it is that uh, at the beginning I didn't um, do the project by myself. I actually hired a vendor to do it for me, and and then half a year later um, the product, the software itself, is you know become you know shit. <laughs> so um, I have to start it over again by myself, and and that's the reality that you you know have to face. I mean, seriously, um, the product itself you know wasn't look like that um, you know half a year ago, and then um, if I stop it, then you know I'm not here today. So I think you need to be very mentally strong to you know just keep move, moving forward and have the belief you know to. Yeah, do it by yourself, you have no partner. Yeah. So despite all the difficulty, what she gives you guys to continue doing what you are doing now? What makes you guys feel so happy? What's the most enjoyable moments you've uh, had so far? Before I answer that question, I want to add a little bit about the difficulties. Um, Frank mentioned a really fair point about finding the right people to work with you or work uh, for you. Um, I also have tried a lot of stuff uh, before I do my internet business. I still do. I, I, I come up with this idea because there's no setup fund, right? Uh, setup cost. So I just came up with this idea with a friend that would say, okay, maybe we'll do this and, and let's try out. But nine out of ten, if the, if the friend actually have a full-time job that, and, then, and then the project is not earning money upfront or earning enough money upfront, uh, it tends to fail. It tends to fail. So for um, a startup, what really is the it's the key things you need to grab before moving on. I uh, tend to buy the Bao Chang's idea. I will find a solid partner first. The partner that, that they can, you know, suffer from uh, financial difficulties and... <laughs> <laughs> which, it, which is almost um, a, a sure thing if you start something at, at, at the beginning. Um, and then we can, there's a chance that we can uh, move on to something successful. Otherwise, um, it's quite hard. I will 
to add something on the difficulty part. I think there are two parts of difficulty. One part is the opposite of Bao Chang's. Well, he's uh, struggling and finding something to do. I'm struggling and finding time to do things. So with a full-time job, and then also another full-time job on the side, it means a lot of times when I have 8 a.m. morning meeting, the next day I'm still sitting in front of my laptop, working on the uh, website at 2 a.m., and then thinking, shit, I only have five hours to sleep. So it's, we have a lot of great ideas to, to how to make this salon bigger and uh, more media coverage and stuff, but the two of us are just struggling to find time to do that. And the other part uh, of difficulty is quite unexpected. It's about dealing with people. So working in finance, everyone thinks that we deal with a lot of people every day and we know how to deal with people. But the fact is, when you're dealing with people who is not driven by the mutual monetary interest, it's super difficult. I've met speakers who got cold feet two hours before the speech and told me I don't want to do it. I've met someone who had fights with me just because on um, the simple fact how how much we charge for the tickets. And I've had members who told me that uh, they will quit right after I send out the invitation to I don't know, 500 people. So these are the sort of expectations that you need to learn to manage. And it's something that I found super, super difficult. Definitely, I have experienced with Shui as well. Because both of us have a full-time job. It's difficult to try to manage to have a kind of a part-time job and your interest and your full-time job at the same time. So back to the positive side. So what's the most enjoyable moment you guys have so far? Can you start from Ross? It's difficult to find an enjoyable moment. <laughs> I think um, for us, yeah, I think the most enjoyable moment is uh, we got the uh, government funding today uh, because uh, we applied for the project in August. So the first uh, scheduled presentation is September 15th or 14th, I don't remember. Then uh, my partners from Singapore, they all flew to Hong Kong. But unfortunately, it was the Baha Feng Shou. So uh, everything was canceled. So it was a day trip for my partner. So they flew back to Singapore, waste the whole day, uh, and one day and they leave. Then, uh, then we rescheduled the presentation to uh, October the 4th or something. Uh, then everybody flew to, from Singapore again. And then uh, we went to Science Park, uh, did the presentation. Uh, I think the most enjoyable moment is that uh, we got, uh, the, the, because you, there's a five judges to, to decide if they got the funding or not. Uh, at, at least you have to got three or more. I think the most enjoyable moment for us is that uh, we got all five yes uh, in like 20 seconds after our pr presentation. So uh, I think that's the most enjoyable moment so far. Uh, because you saw you spending, uh, you spend like a couple months, day and night, and then you got uh, admitted by somewhere else. Uh, they are all experts in the industry, so that's encouraged a lot. Although you you, you encountered a lot of problems, uh, team some some your employees just quit, and then at the moment you think hey, everything worth it. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I can share one story. So after the unconsciousness, unconsciousness and hypnosis session, um, two weeks, three weeks after that, I got an email from a friend uh, telling me that she quit her job and uh, started to search for her spiritual self. I didn't think, I didn't know what that means and uh, how is that related to balcony until uh, I was meeting with a couple of friends talking about her and one of one of friends asked. Uh, Jane is the girl. Uh, did you quit because you attended balcony session? And Jane said it's uh, partially related because the balcony session uh, talked about hypnosis and the spiritual stuff, which led to her final enlightenment, which happened in I think one week time. And then she decided to quit her job in hedge fund and uh, to go to search for her spiritual self and try to become a therapist in the future. So. I know it's important to have a huge success in terms of larger audience and a lot of money, but to me, the value of Balcony is to try to inspire people and to connect people, and that is the golden moment, I think, out of the eight, six months I've done Balcony so far. Definitely, definitely.
Uh, I just quickly talk about um, positive moments. I think I'm quite scientific when it comes to this. I mean, I have a goal, and then if I get closer to the goal, then I'm happy. So, uh, so the goal is to help people socialize last minute. So when I when I see that people are creating events on the platform and uh, other people join, when I see people making new friends, when I see people enjoying themselves and um, making new connections, um, and I see that these these bankers or, or busy people uh, are better, can better socialize uh, because of us, um, then, then I'm happy. That, that's, that's the happiest time. And for me, it's uh, quite similar. Uh, if I reach my goal, then I'm happy. Um, and my, my goal, if you remember, is the personal finance uh, side of stuff. So thinking back in time, my let go moment uh, that my boss fired me, um, it's a quite sad mix excitement kind of moment, although the dark age starts from there. But thinking of that moment, I still cherish it a lot. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a moral uh, moment for myself. And also, there's, a, there's like this picture um, I just think of. Uh, when I was in uh, Kyoto traveling, um, taking care of my uh, client's stuff, uh, business, uh, through internet w with my iPad, and I'm looking out outside the window and see the, um, see the view and on travel. So I can see, okay, now this is what a um, location freedom look like. So you can just travel, do your stuff. Um, it, it, it doesn't affect your business. So that's a good moment. Um, so for me, actually, it's, um, at the beginning, it was just an idea. So I talked to my friend a lot. So um, people you know, criticize, don't believe in it, you know, and then um, probably thinking you know, it's not going to work. So, um, you know, time after time, I start to build up things. And then my friend, you know, start to become supporting. And I'm kind of feeling, you know, good about this. Because you are turning someone who don't, didn't believe it. And then they, when they see your progress, you are making progress. And they start to believe that, you know, the business can be success in the future. And I think that's um, quite satisfying. Yes. You guys have talked about goals. You said if you have a goal and you met the goal, you will feel happy. I just want to ask you, what is your expectation? What is your goal when you start your own business? And how you guys are doing so far? Have you guys ever thought about becoming the next Zuckerberg? Or next to Steve Jobs? <laughs> um, I think uh, just... Uh, my goal is that I, since I decided to quit uh, last week, um, yeah, yeah, I resigned, I resigned, I resigned from my full-time job last week. Uh, so now I'm just like, uh, channel, like I'm, I'm running out of like, cash flow. So I think uh, my goal is like to, as a as a as a co-founder of the company, I think my goal is like shot. Uh, I, I put in a short-term, mid-term and long. So my short-term goal is like to let the company survive. Um, that's the more, most important things. Because uh, I'm not sure if uh, you imagine the, if you think about the uh, business model of Showbox, because uh, we repay we pay users for uh, checking out the advertisements or information. So we, have, we do have a very strong cash outflows. Uh, as the user grow larger, your cash outflows just get larger and larger. Uh, you want to you want to you want to retain users on your platform. Just keep spending. Um, that's why we need more capital injections, like compared to uh, the other other products. So I think the, the most important thing for us is just survive. Uh, how we manage our cash flows to get uh, as many as uh, advertisement or apps download for our platform. So if ever, anyone here you want to like uh, you're in the advertising that industry marketing. Just contact me. That help us survive. Yeah. What's the, how's it go? So, um, um, similar to Rose, I resigned last month from my full time job as well. So um, my goal is probably um, the product is near to the end of the development process. So um, my goal is probably the first one is start to generate cash flow. And um, maybe hopefully half a year um, can have you know see some restaurant to use it, and I think that's it. Because um, I, I have other plans as well. So after this product, I probably will try to do something else. 
So uh, just, um, I mean, basically, after development, there's nothing for me to do. I just have to run a server and, you know, do some email reply. So um, then we'll target the next product. So um, yeah, that's my goal. Um, for my current business, um, it's been going on a while, and then I have a taste of it. Um, I don't see it scaling to any large scale. So, um, my goal for for my current business is um, is to just to let it happen. So, when somebody needs you, I'm here for for that help. Um, and my goal is actually trying to move into their uh, their <coughs> industries. Um, I try to come up with products, like I've said before, or I'm trying to use my uh, internet marketing knowledge and expertise in this kind of area and uh, uh, just just to work with somebody who has the other expertise and came up with a new business <coughs> idea. For example, right now I'm helping one of my clients to uh, who is teaching healthy cooking stuff. Uh, uh, her, her basic, her basic uh, uh, business model right now is to teach class and uh, to whole, whole, uh, whole cooking class basically. So I think what you, what you do is definitely can work well online, right? You can just record a video, put online, come up with a package so that the world can see what you do. I'm trying to get into all this kind of uh, business ventures with uh, the other interesting people to work together. I think I want to be the, you know, the, the, the internet marketer of uh, a lot of different kind of businesses. Um, yeah, so when I think about the future and kind of the, the bull case, um, think of it as uh, in two parameters. One is the magnitude of the upside and the probability of it. So for the problem where we're trying to solve, I think uh, it's a big enough problem, it's a big enough market. I think of it like a social version of LinkedIn. So if you say, do, I, do, do you think I'll be Zuckerberg? I, you know, I, I think, um, no. But, <laughs> but um, um, I think the, the, the market that we're in is big enough to deliver that kind of a scale. But at the same time, uh, I also, realize that the probability of that is extremely low. I think one, uh, I, I was told that I think one in 600 startups um, make it to break even or kind of replace salary or like that kind of level that survive. And that's just survival. It's not even kind of making reasonable money or re making banking money. So the probability weighted upside is definitely lower than a banking job. Um, so when you know, when, when I think about it, obviously, there's, there's other stuff in it for me that makes me want to do it. And even though the probability is lower, I still like to take this chance to be able to bring something new to the world. Um, so that's how I think about it. Um, the, the slogan we picked for this entrepreneurship forum is think big and start small. And I think every single one of us here are actually living that sentence. Um, for us, um, I envision Balcony Saloon to, to not just being a local platform, but we are thinking about expanding it globally in terms of setting up different centers in, uh, say, London, New York, wherever there are people who has this sort of social need, and then connect it online. That's why we made the website the first thing after we started Balcony Saloon, is try to make every resources available online so that we can, in the future, build a global network where um, young, peop young professionals can share their passion and inspire each other. So a bit more advertisement for us. For, for those of you who haven't seen our website, please go to the balconysalon.com. You can share <laughs> you can all past events here. And also, after talking about goals, definitely we were thinking about how you guys are going to reach your goals. What do you need are your competitive advantage? how you can win over your competitors or your peers to make your business successful. So just to go quickly go along. Maybe start from Mark. Yeah. Um. yeah, competitiveness is actually one key part if you think about your business idea. Um, so I get into something that is segmented, meaning that I, I provide customer service for uh, help for people who have very unique needs. So I don't, I don't see there's a big company coming over just to take all my clients away because they cannot provide the you know, hands-held uh, service I can provide. So, but that's also a weak point because if I'm doing that, I cannot really scale to a larger scale. So, um, um, so if, if I do what I do right now, I, I don't, uh, I don't care, care about competitiveness uh, that much. I just deliver the best 
that I can do. Um, but for the futures, I, I would like the other says, to, like if you have like a product, I do think that you need to, you know, become one of the best. But for IT and uh, software and uh, internet, uh, what there's good things is that if there's a better product of yourself, just copy it, right? <laughs> if, uh, if, uh, if you are the best, then that's good. If there's someone who copy yours and improve, then you copy back. Just be the first, right? Legally, of course. <laughs> Do your homework. So um, know each other, you know, know the competitor in the market. So what I did um, before the development is to, you know, understand what company is in the market to buy the same service. So and then you look at the price, the functions, of course, you know, you copy some of the functions. So, so um, and you know that. So during the development process, you have to try to, you know, beat them by the functionality, the price. So um, I think that's how you stay competitive. And well, um, it's near to the end of development. So um, I, you know, so in, in maybe a few months' time, uh, I will know how competitive the product is. <laughs> so I'll pass it to Rose. Uh, I think uh, there's no barrier for internet industry because uh, if you do no coding, you have a team, you can start doing anything. So the most important thing for uh, internet or mobile internet companies is do it fast and do it quick. For Showbox, I think nobody want to uh, install two lock screen app in their mobile phone, so I will just try to be the first one and occupy uh, most Android users' uh, smartphone as soon as possible. So far, we don't see any competitors in Hong Kong, but we do see competitors in uh, overseas market. But um, I believe this, uh, it's a very localized, localized, localized uh, a uh, business model, it needs a lot of vertical integration, so it's not it's not like geography scalable business, but we can do a lot uh, more and deeper in the in the local. So as, it's good to, good to see that we don't have C competition now, but we are just trying to move fast, adding more functions, uh, try to grab users as many as possible. So please refer to your friends about Showbox, if you see any Android phones, thanks. I think we're a bit different. Um, when we were in Japan, like when we thought of an idea, the first thing we did is to Google for days, like what are our competitors? We'll build spreadsheets on what they do, what's their advantage, disadvantage. And um, the idea uh, impromptu, we've not found something that's exactly the same. Like there are similar things, but we find that this, is, this might be something that's quite unique um, in, 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 in the market. So actually we, um, we don't think there is yet direct competition. Although our attitude to a competition is that we would welcome competition. Like it would validate our view that this market is worth exploring. If, if for the next few years we're still the only one kind of doing it, then it would mean like maybe a reason that no one's doing it. <laughs> so, um, um, and I think competition is good. I mean, it helps us improve products. It helps our users um, benefit more. I think the market is big enough for a few big players. And um, I'm trying to, uh, balance between what Ross said about moving fast and and and, and quick versus um, perseverance. Like um, I think it's it's also equally important that you give it enough time, whatever idea that you have. Um, there are a lot of things that could change in the process. Um, if you're, if, I think there's there's some value uh, towards patience in in this industry, even though it's a fast moving you know, in, industry. So. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to our first major competitor. Um, my story is even more different. I started Balcony without any awareness of any other competitor out there. I just didn't do research at all. And I, when I started, I didn't even know Ted. And then I learned about Ted, and I was like, oops, that's. <laughs> <laughs> and then I learned about Yixi, which is the Chinese copy of Ted. And then there are. I don't know, at least five out there is doing similar things. But I think uh, we are managing, we are trying to find an, our edge in front of those all sorts of social media platform. Like TED is more focusing on this sharing ideas. It's, it's usually a big conference with thousands of people. And then it doesn't have this 
um, intimate uh, environment here where you can actually talk to each other, where, where you actually meet friends. So I think that's the share, uh, the connect part is something that we're trying to make ourselves stand out in front of the other competitors that we are mostly unaware of. <laughs> is having a similar talk today, yeah, inviting another founder of Showbox. So we are very happy we have invited her. <laughs> this is the organization based in Beijing, which basically copied the test idea. And then they're having a Hong Kong branch something which holds conference every one, twice every year, and they're holding one exactly right now. And inviting another founder of Showbox. We're <laughs> <laughs> happy that you guys stick with us. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, about if you guys, your business, um, are going to be successful in a few years, have you guys thought about the exit plan? What's the exit options for you guys? Ever have you ever thought about going for IPO or your company <laughs> being bought by another company or anything like that? Uh, yes, you have to think about it carefully because uh, before you before you approach an investor, you have to tell them how you can exit. That's the very basic thing you have to prepare. Uh, but you can lie to your investors. Uh, always, often you just say, "Hey, you can go just do an IPO or something." But for me, for for uh, um, for me and for my uh, partners, we we want to we want to run a very cool company. Uh, we want to do cool things. Uh, uh, we want to right now uh, build up our company cultures, and uh, the company may not like be as big as Google, Facebook, or Tencent, but it's uh, our self like I'm proud. Uh, you can do things you like. You can tra just trace the latest technology, and you have great teams. Uh, you, it's not like working. You, you like you, you you spend daytime together with them, not just working, but uh, have fun together. It's uh, I and my partners. Uh, dream about. So about exit, I think, uh, well, I haven't, haven't really think about it carefully, but uh, you imagine that you may be acquired by some other big companies or maybe it goes bigger, I feel. But don't think of it too much uh, because uh, if you think too much about this, you cannot focus on what you need to do. Um, I always believe that as a very young startup company, um, the most important thing is to talk to your clients, talk to your users, know how they feel about your products, focus on the tedious and small things, uh, and then uh, you improve your products and, and, and enhance the overall uh, your quality. I think then you start to think about uh, maybe what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I don't want to see too long, I don't see too long, I just want to focus on what I'm doing right now. Can you share a bit more? Alright, so, so IPO or not, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's like worrying kind of whether my grand, grandchildren is going to go to Cambridge or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very long, uh, very far away. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't really think about that. Um, but I think, I mean, there are, there are many exit options. Um, M&A in this space is quite active. Um, there, are, there are big high profile M&A's where you make a lot of money and you just retire like Instagram people. Um, and there are very small scale M&A's where they just kind of buy you out at a slight premium to your cost and then you move on to your next venture. So all these are, are possible exit options. Or you just, I mean because you don't have a lot of upfront costs anyway, you just suck it up and then you say, hey, it's not working, then let's, let's move on. That's pivot, pivot, which is like a term that people use in this world, this technical world to say that our idea isn't quite working, we're going to kind of turn it and try to make it work again. So um, I think it's just, it's too early to think about it and you keep that in mind as a kind of long term goal, but um, yeah, we, we don't think about exit right now. I think I, I want to say something about asset that what I thought about it. Um, when people are thinking about asset, asset um, it, is, it usually means that asset to money. I mean that you, you want own something, finally you want to turn into cash. Um, I like cash, but I don't see that to be my final, final destination of uh, personal assets. If I have cash, I will consider I will be anxious. I, I don't want to have a lot of cash. 
I want to have assets that will generate cash flow. <laughs> I want to see cash flow. I don't want to see cash. Cash means almost nothing to me.、Uh, if I can trade it with a very high yield cash flow. So for me, it's like okay. So if if this company can make you X amount of money, why do you want to sell it for ten ten X time or for twenty X time?、Um, if if only twenty X time, probably five percent yield is pretty decent for a lot of investment, right? I will keep it myself. Thank you.、Um, if I can sell it for a hundred times, well, maybe we can talk about numbers.、Um, So for me, it's like、uh, when I think of asset strategy, I will think about replace myself. For example, I'm actively in the business right now, so I do a lot of service myself. I do. I'm planning to, you know,、uh, hire helpers and come up with a, you know, the working document and process optimization, so that I can help.、Uh, I can hire a average、um, IQ college graduate <laughs> and just let them do all the work. So that, so that this is cash cow for me, huh? It's good. Like like passive income, so that's my thought about、um, exit. I guess that's a lot of people's dream. Having a lot of people working for you and get a free cash flow. <laughs> so I ask a lot about the business questions, what's your competitive advantage, what's your business plan. But I want to get into something more personal. So how does starting a business affect your personal life? How do friends, your girlfriends, or friends? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be the first. I I didn't start with a prestigious enough job, so、um, I'm quite happy with what I'm I'm earning right now. So、um, my friends, um, well, they envy my freedom of location and time. I I think the most the majority of that is positive, and、uh, my family do worry about my situation a year ago, because、uh, I'm, we're trying something new that nobody know. Your success rate is so it's a、uh, it's a、uh, quiet gambling in that kind of sense. But、uh, my close friend, my girlfriend supports me, so that's very important as well. Yeah. So、um, after I quit my job,、um, my girlfriend also quit her job, <laughs> <laughs> and then after I started the startup, my girlfriend also started her startup. So I guess it's a positive influence. Um, I don't know how we're gonna kind of survive.、Uh, so my parents、uh, are very supportive. Like my mom asks me、um, if I have enough money to kind of feed myself, and then they offer to kind of give me some money. And then I say,、oh, it's, no, it's all right. I still have some savings to,、uh, you know, the market is is a bull market, and、uh, stocks are going up. So. I, 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 I'm getting some dividend from some stocks. And that, that's all right to to feed myself.、Um, I think friends mostly they don't. I don't think they look at you. If anything, I think that, I, I get the sense that they 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 a bit envious of my freedom. <laughs> like I don't really. I don't see people who say, "Oh man, you're not. You know, you you're so poor now, or you know, you don't make money." I get people like, "Wow, you're going to that place. Oh, you're doing this. That's so cool." So that's, so that's kind of the general the general sense I guess, and then people people always ask me like, so if you had stayed in banking, you'd be you know VP or ED now, and you would have worked for almost ten years, and then how do you how do you make the decision to to transit? And I think the questions from that from from those people are actually because they they themselves are thinking about some changes.、Um, so I think I, I at least I don't think I've lost friends because of. Entrepreneurship, anything I made some friends, and、um, I think there is. It's very important that your your family and and loved ones、uh, support you.、Um, they 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 have similar、uh, life goals、um, with you. I think yeah, I I consult a lot of friends.、Uh, Not a lot. I don't have a lot of friends. I, co- <laughs> I, I, I consult a couple of friends、uh, before I made a decision. Actually, started from two months ago.、Uh, no one said yes.、Uh, Everyone said no. Consider about it. You're gonna risk a lot.、Uh, you're working 
for like good company, uh, got solid cash flows. Uh, why you do this? It's gonna be risky. Uh, you're not gonna marry in ten years, something like that. Um, but I still I decided to quit uh, because I I think nobody understand me uh, or understand Showbox than I do. Uh, they don't see the potential. They don't they don't understand how we're gonna make this make this dream or business model happen. So I think I think uh, if you just trust yourself, uh, you can just take others' friends' opinion as a reference, but don't be influenced by the others. Uh, trusting trusting in yourself because you uh, know your know yourself best. Uh, and I asked my family, I asked my mom. Um, he's uh, always supporting uh, to me, and as he said, "Hey son, you just go ahead. I'm not going to tell your father." <laughs> uh, so my father, uh, he doesn't know yet. Uh, I quit. <laughs> and my mom, every time he calls me, just to find a corner and say, "Hey, how's the business going?" Uh, I say, "Yeah, it goes well, it goes well." So um, I hope I can tell my father that I quit my job earlier. Uh, when today um, we we get a positive cash flow for for show box. Uh, yeah. But uh, as, of, as of now, uh, we, we launched three three weeks. Uh, the first month is uh, uh, if, if you if you reduce if you doesn't consider the marketing cost, we're actually making profit for about a thousand Hong Kong dollar. But it's a milestone. Yeah. yeah. starting to build up confidence that you know people around you because actually I started my project um, you know after half a year and then someone asked me do you want to take this project and actually um, I'm actually actually getting more um, outsourced projects after I doing this project so I think build up confidence for people around me and um, it's quite similar to you know other speakers as well you know you get the freedom yeah, I, I don't have anything to add because, you know, it's very similar, yeah. so I don't want to repeat it. Um, I think my parents are super supportive. I believe they're the only two who actually watched my video from the first second to the last second, even though they don't understand a word of English <laughs> every time after a session. So, And um, they, every pi single picture I posted on Moment about Balcony, they were they will post it again on their moments as well. <laughs> and uh, my mom was trying to secretly transfer money to my account because, <laughs> because, because I told her about um, how we need to spend money for that. And she said she has to be the first angel investor. I rejected her offer because I, I, it doesn't feel uh, earned if it's from parents. So, but they're super supportive. And as for friends, I think most of friends are supportive as well. And uh, I made a lot of new friends through this alone. The only thing I'm missing is to spending quality time with my friends because I need to um, sacrifice my personal time to work on this alone. And uh, apologize for uh, my core friends who have supported me so for so long. What advice would you give to the audience who wants to start new business? What are, what are the resources you would recommend to them? Um, I start first. Um, just fuck up and do it. Um, well, I mean, if you are, I mean, think about what do you want to do every day. You don't want to go to work at night and then you know sit in the desk, you know, and, and you know go back home very late. So if you have any idea, I mean, financially, I think. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I'm not very rich, so I think most people can do it, if, you know, they they start, you know, executing the, the process. So my advice is that, you know, if you have any plan, just do it, you know, nothing goes, you know. Um, yeah, I just said that if you've you got an idea, just do it right now, uh, right away. Uh, actually, it's not that easy. Um, you have to think about you're not gonna make money for maybe one year or two years, so you better um, get a great a lot of like capital injection that support you, give you salary. That's one scenario. Uh, like Facebook, they burn money for a couple couple of years, or even still burn money. But it's one scenario. If you got a big big investors, you can do it. But for most of startups, I think they are doing small things. That they're starting from very small idea, uh, very small team. So you better think about if you can survive 
I mean, uh, if, you, if you can buy buy your next lunch tomorrow, that's a very real, realistic problem. So uh, be prepared. Uh, got your self-funding, uh, then you can get started. Don't, I mean, it's 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 a it's not an easy decision to make if you have a full-time job. Um, because make yourself financially healthy first. Uh, otherwise, uh, we think about it. Uh, um, this, uh, this is my advice. Because uh, if, if you can survive, that's a very, I mean, you, you have to think about if you can find that right? Um, I got something to add. Um, I think um, most of you guys have a you know, full-time job. So my recommendation could, you know, spend some money working in part time. So um, start from small, maybe a uh, few thousand or maybe uh, twenty thousand per month, and you know hire some people work for you. You know, China has the great resources, <laughs> so, so you can go to Taobao or whatever you know network to find someone to work for you. So um, it, it doesn't necessarily to be very you know difficult. You just have to find the right person. So um, yeah. Uh, my first uh, suggestion is to like my page. <laughs> uh, I, will, I plan to sh share a lot of numbers and detailed strategies of my past, uh, especially mistakes that I've made uh, for uh, personal investment, uh, financial investment, uh, business investment, etc. So salaryreplacement.com, please. And um, to talk, talking about actual starting a business, um, I think if you, ha you know that how much money you're going to earn in that business, it's a very easy decision for you whether or not you want to quit your job. That's just easy decision. You have your preference, but you can do it like that. It's, it's when you are not sure whether you will work out or not, um, it's the hard part. So for me, I'm quite conservative, so I'll keep my um, current employment and also try out things. The thing is about try out things. If you can find a good way to try out whether your idea works or not on a smaller scale, well, well, in the in the development, we call it uh, minimum viable product, meaning that it is it's like a prototype of a stuff. For example, if Bacon is alone uh, could work in ten people, then probably could work in a uh, thousand people. So just find that ten close friend, like like uh, like you being just hold an event of twenty per, uh, twenty people attendees, and actually go through the entire process without charging them, and see if. At, People are actually getting the benefits. If you if you try different aspect of your business idea, and in a very small scale, affordable to lose, um, then I think you have a better, you know, confidence whether it's time to make that jump, to, just to focus on on time. For me, if I look uh, look back, I probably could could um, you know quit a little bit earlier because I obviously already have paying clients at that time. I just need to, you know, go out and meet people more and sure that it will come. Uh, almost sure. Nothing is 100% sure. When I was in the final year in school in 2004, everyone wanted to get into an investment bank. And at the time, the attitude towards investment bank is, is no-brainer, just do it. Like, you know, it's the best, best job in the world. And I feel that there's a certain element of that happening in the startup world. When I applied for the Cyberpoint Incubation Program a year ago, there were 100 applicants for a place, for 15 to 20 places. And Less than a year later, there were 400 applicants for the last batch. So there are a lot of people getting into startup world for, I don't know whether it's actually um, the, the thing that they want to do or just peer pressure or the cool factor or some Zuckerberg factor that kind of guy people want to do it. It might not make everyone happy doing it. So I think the first step is, my advice would be the first step is ask yourself, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to be? What makes you happy? Those kind of bigger questions to have to think about. And then the second advice is to read, read books. First one is Lean Startup, which is, talks about the minimum viable products that Mark talked about. It's a great book. It's like the Bible for startups right now. The second book is called e -Myth Revisited. It talks about small businesses and how to run small businesses. Um, it's, it's written by, by a US uh, business consultant. Also a very popular book. And the third book is Rich Dad Poor Dad, talks about personal finance. So after you read those three books, after you think about some big questions, you still think, I want to do it, then you just do it. Right, thank you. Um, I have two small 
uh, advice to add to echo what Dr. Chang just said. I think it's quite important for you to ask yourself what you really want in life because doing startups or um, doing what I'm social enterprises, uh, no matter you could a job or you don't could a job, it's it's uh, not a very wise choice, uh, risk return adjusted, if you know what I mean. Like compared to a very stable finance job, it's definitely not a very risk return adjusted good choice. So you need to know that this is what you want. Uh, there are a, a lot of motivations for doing that. For me personally, it's because I cannot get this kind of satisfaction from the finance world. I need to start something of my own to, to get this s s sort of self-realization to keep me going. And I believe there are a hundred reasons for everyone here who wants to start up. But just think if this is worth doing, if this is what you really want for the rest of your life. And the other one is to, if you're sure, then just don't hesitate because you will be amazed at how many, how much resources is available out there for you. When I first started, I don't, I don't know. I have so many friends who's willing to help, and then I've got Eva helping me on the camera, and Bruce helping me with photographing, and Samantha helping me with the logistics. Every one of them is willing to offer help um, without money. You, you will be amazed on the resources you have out there. I'd like to thank you all, our teammates as well. They all offer to help without giving, without us paying any financial benefits. So with, with that, we finish our talk today. Thank you all the speakers for your very interesting sharing today. Let's give a big applause to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the Q&A session, let me do a quick survey. So of all the audience here who are thinking about starting your own business or who have already started your business, could you stand up or just by showing your hands? Wow, well, that's a lot. Well, do you guys want to just uh, briefly introduce yourself and very brief about your business idea? If you just uh, if you guys want, you can just stand up and introduce yourself. Anybody here? You just stand up and then shout me. I'll start first, but firstly I would like to um, thank the speakers to give us this very inspiring sharing, especially by knowing Mark and you being a lot of friends. I'm very proud of you guys. And to quickly introduce myself, I'm uh, Elaine, and I'm doing marketing for cosmetic company. And the idea that I'm having now, and the marketing you know, the first thing, um, is trying to start a lifestyle brand. Um, so it's still at the very beginning stage for our in the way of doing sourcing and also we're in the way of forming teams so actually we're looking for designers so if anyone knows like any designer who's interested to draw or give ideas about the startup in terms of like a light luxury that's what we're training for and the brand is a beach lifestyle brand so we're trying to do some bikinis we're trying to do some um, accessories and uh, the idea is very big the idea is trying to transform the beach lifestyle in Asia because we think it's still quite missing. So we want to fit in and try to fill up this gap. And uh, that will be me. restaurant um, which can provide people more um, vegetable intake and as, a, as in um, a tasty healthy food in a way um, so that's what I'm working on um, so so if any of you are interested in this area um, you are welcome to talk to me and um, yeah that's it and thank you so much My name is 
Soyo. Um, I have a commodity trading firm in Hong Kong, Dubai, and uh, Africa, uh, Ghana. It's Africa for everyone. So um, right now we are doing uh, supplying wood and lumber, and also share butter. You probably know that it's more than two kind of coffee shop, a lot of things. So commodity trading is what I'm doing, and I'm uh, seeking advice from someone like Mark Wan because we are doing. I'm, I'm trying to. Comp I was previously working at the private equity, so I'm trying to combine the really local, local Ghanian, like African style of supplying raw materials and also the investment world that you do on Bloomberg and stuff. I'm trying to combine the both, so a lot of ideas can happen. I'm opening a furniture shop in Ghana. Ghana is in West Africa, Arabian football, just for you. <laughs> no one knows where it is. Hi everyone, I'm Bill. Uh, I was also a technologist at investment bank. I quit my job like four months ago. Uh, but unlike most of that, I don't really have the idea yet. Uh, but what I do is like uh, I have some savings I can like pick up for some time. But what I do try to find an idea was like I try to visit a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, I think when you really jump out, jump into this entrepreneurial world, you can find a lot of friends and then watch their things same mind with you and then you probably get some better idea and then met some meet some new friends, get more inspiration. Um, so after four months I've been I mean enjoying this journey and then yeah so I would encourage you to do some you know, some ideas. Um, and also I have one more book to recommend. Um, <laughs> really uh, I think it's like called rework and then you transform you like thinking about how you work in a corporate world and a startup world. And one more book is like, uh, <laughs> how would you measure your life? I think most of you heard about it. Uh, I also encourage you to read that. Yeah. Next. Uh, hello everyone. I'm Yi, and I'm from. Um, I work as a general generalist, and uh, for the, like uh, for a couple of, uh, months, as I quit four months ago. Uh, as well. And the interesting thing is that the. Uh, some friends approached me, and we did a we did a summer camp in, in the summer for the for the, for the uh, students in, in China in Chengdu. Uh, so they came, and my friend said, "Let's do something in education." I said, "Yes, I quit my job." But now now they followed, but they all took their job, and I don't I don't want that. So currently I have two business. I, I try to work as a freelancer right now. So I have two business, and uh, uh, one is a tr more traditional business. Uh, another is I'm trying to make an SNS social media, uh, yeah. So quite similar to one in your guest uh, That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very early stage and I'm trying to build my own APP and uh, APS. Thank you. together on the yeah. next session which is uh, hiking and diving in, and at the end of the summer. What's the name of your what's the name of your organization? <laughs> <laughs> it's called uh, Go To Travel. So Go and To and in Chinese it's actually you can also say Go R Travel. <laughs> so partly because we think in traveling people can be R and be silly and silly. Thank you so much for the platform, it's really interesting.
Uh, the second thing is that the nonprofit that I started is to do policy research uh, in something called impact investing. Right? Policy research is important because uh, a lot of it is an area where if governments do not support it, it is very difficult to scale. So, for example, if you're starting a social enterprise, you you need various support, and you need the regulations to be able to support you. Like, for example, if a key vote to start here. Or, or Kickstarter wants to do something to create money, right, to raise money. Now, right now, Kickstarter technically is asking for donations in exchange and giving you uh, something in appreciation. It could be a product or a ni nice note that's written to you. They're not actually raising money. Now, on the other hand, if you want to do fundraising, a proper crowdfunding sort of platform, you're going to run into a lot of problems relating to the SFC because you are actually selling securities, you're raising money, and the people are very concerned about protection of minority interests and shareholders. Right? So the government can actually help to make the environment friendly for startups by revamping some financial rules. So one of the things that the nonprofit that I look at, uh, that I founded called Asia Community Ventures, is we will in fact look at lobbying the government and proposing new ideas that the government can do to, pro to support the system. Right? So partly as a result of the work we have done, uh, you may or may not be aware of it, the Hong Kong government announced a 500 million Hong Kong dollar fund called the Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Fund uh, earlier this year. Uh, the, the first 100 million tranche will be released sometime in the coming year. And their website, you can go ssie.gov.hk, uh, dot I think. Uh, you can look at the details of what types of enterprises that they're willing to fund. And that's one of them. The second thing I like to find that we have started is, is probably more of a social enterprise. Uh, it's called Jinseng with two eyes. Uh, our website is jinseng.org. Uh, as you can tell from the ORG website, it is a non-profit, but we have not applied for charitable status because the model is different. The model relies on membership. Uh, the purpose of Jinseng is to allow you to learn about working with entrepreneurs. Uh, some of it are social, some of it may not be. But at the end of the day, you don't have to quit your job, right? You can stay where you are, learn about the, the, the space, meet with entrepreneurs, meet with uh, other people like yourself. And Janet is actually uh, one of my co-founders in Ginseng. We will be launching probably in the next uh, month or so. So we hope that to be able to uh, uh, you know, work with uh, the group here and maybe with uh, Impromptu to help us with that. Thank you for giving me chance to speak. Thank you. Uh, we would encourage to ask more general questions when everybody's here. And if you have specific questions, um, the speakers will be all available after the session that you can ask privately. Uh, yeah. uh, today is quite, uh, quite interesting because we have more girls right now than boys and gentlemen. So I'm interested. Uh, the gentlemen, do you have a, a female in your team, or a, a, what's the comment about this? It's, a, it's a really. I've never seen so many girls in the. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have yet, but uh, we're recruiting. Uh, we're recruiting <laughs> several positions. Uh, one is marketing. Uh, one is sales. Uh, one designer. So. But no co-founders. No, 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 no. Uh, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I, should, I should have five of them. No, but I did it. Just go twice. There are so many girls who are interested in founding their own business. But from my experience of hiring for Balcony, we are uh, actively seeking for partners. Every single one who said they're interested in the girls. So I don't know if it's a business type. Like they're IT based, we are more social communication based. Probably that's not. I have yet to see a guy who's volunteered to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me keep my thought about women in the in the startup. Actually, actually, just in internet. Um, my personal belief is that women will be better than men in internet space. Um, because technically, well, you can hire a coder to do that. Um, if you can grasp the knowledge of what is doable in the internet, then it's, uh, it's just how much you, you need to pay for that guy to write you a code. 
but the communication part is is more important than ever in internet because come coming to you know a a good sales copy or a good presentation and a good uh, video and a good marketing strategy and really touching your heart through a computer screen I believe those are very fandom skills um, so if I if I go go out and hire a helper, which I did, um, I right now have one uh, part time helper just started a few days ago. Uh, she's from Philippines. Um, she can do much better artwork than I did, ever. Well, she did quite slow, but uh, I need to coach her on that. But um, I, I believe that like copywriting, a lot of the the you know the difficult stuff in a in a creating a new product or new apps or or something. Is is by those visual or uh, more intuitive sense of uh, power. So, for women there, I would encourage you to you know forget about. Uh, uh, it's not that difficult because we have enough intelligent people to help you to you know get over the coding side of the things. Uh, I also want to just share two two anecdotal facts about that. Uh, we, we've hired a full-time employee, as you saw probably in the photo, and she's a girl. And in the process, we interviewed. 20, 30 uh, final year students to decide who to hire. And most of the people that apply to us and we interviewed are also girls. So um, it's, it's quite interesting how, I think maybe Hong Kong is just doing really well encouraging girls to study computer science and, and technology. <laughs> um, another, another fact is that one of the quite active uh, investors in, in Hong Kong, he's a foreigner, uh, quite, quite wealthy, and he, he, he once said that he would prefer to invest in companies funded by women, especially women with kids. Because he thinks it's a hell of a task to be able to juggle um, to be to, to be a mom, so he, he prefers to invest in women. Um, for me, I think it's important to understand that the Starting up in Hong Kong instead of some other places, say for example in China, where I just went to be, uh, I went to Hangzhou last month, and in Hangzhou because of Alibaba and everything is very booming, with lots of investments flowing on, lots of venture capital, they're very willing to invest into in particular into that business, and um, I'm just curious about because most of the guys here is doing into that business, so I don't. I, I'm willing to know what you think about starting up a business, internet business in Hong Kong instead of other cities. I think that's matter. Uh, for, for internet, I think the second part of internet startup is you can work anywhere. You can work from home, you can work in Hong Kong, Beijing, Silicon Valley. Because uh, internet connects the world. So no matter where you start with, uh, everybody you can share your products, promote things with the internet easily if you've got a good market strategy. So then you see if I do is in Beijing, like WeChat team is in Guangzhou, uh, Alibaba in Hangzhou, uh, all kinds of companies in different places. I don't think, uh, it's not like traditional like industries, like say, uh, if you're mining or a coal business, you have to select some carefully about where you're gonna locate your uh, factories, or because you have to think about logistics, uh, transportation fees, but in the internet, everything still becomes a very light asset. You don't have any assets. The only asset you have is human resource, intelligence, and your execution abilities. So, for um, Hong Kong, I think it's a good place to start with. Um, the, the government funding programs, uh, there's a couple of um, programs that can help you to start out with. Uh, the local competition is not that high, not incentive compared to like Silicon Valley or Hong Kong, China. Uh, in Hong Kong, most people are focusing on the finance area. So we have a lot of spaces to grow. But the, be the, the best side is uh, if you're doing some like vertical service internet business, uh, the market is small. So you're probably going to find an idea that is scalable to, uh, to the world. I mean, uh, it's not just a local service, but um, it's uh, like global product. I don't think Hong Kong is a good place to do work with anything. Um, I, I do agree with Rose, but um, in a proper way, because um, if you are starting with something that's small, you can you know source people from you know different locations. That's fine. 
But um, if you go into a more commercial way, I think Hong Kong is Hong Kong is not a good place because. Um, to be honest, Hong Kong, um, to find a good programmer, or because you are talking about internet business, right? Uh, finding a good programmer, finding a, a good designer, uh, it's very expensive. And, you know, it's not easy to find in Hong Kong. So, um, if you um, want to do a proper business, I mean, um, you cannot source the people in, from Hong Kong. So, I don't really think, I mean, if you're starting from small, you can absolutely, you know, just find some work, one from different area, but if you want to have a proper business, um, I do, and I probably will, you know, source people from China, because there is an international, uh, you know, international um, property that you have to protect, because you are selling your internet software, right? So, um, people work from other location, they have your source code. You know, your source code worth, you know, a lot of money if, you know, you are successful. So. Um, I just think it's not proper, you know, you are not protecting yourself, you know, assets very well. So in my opinion is that you have to locate, have a good location where you can source, you know, intelligent people to help you build, to help you build your uh, business. And they have to work in your office so you can protect your, you know, intellectual property. Otherwise, your, you know, everything, you, someone can steal it from, you know, anywhere. So um, I, I, I agree with Rose that if you start from small, you can start from Hong Kong anywhere you want. But um, in, in a scalable way, I don't think you know Hong Kong is a good place to you know source intelligent people to do the work because um, obviously um, expensive and hard to find. Honestly, I think for internet, um, this is the workspace is one of the big change in the internet um, to the world. Um, when I was in banking, I noticed that a lot of a lot of positions are replaced by Indian. <laughs> this is the trend for not only the bank, but a lot of industries. Like my in business, if I try to, you know, I, I once have thought about this. Uh, I work, uh, I charge like a very cheap part-time uh, worker for a lot of my uh, clients. Um, if they pay me, they will get the best result um, because I'm uh, more qualified than just an average uh, a college grad who, who want to have part-time job, um, but just the, there's a catch. You have to let me uh, worry about how I work and how much I work. If I got improved and increased my uh, cr uh, pro uh, uh, in my uh, productivity, then I get a reward. You just pay me a fixed amount of time. So um, uh, I think a lot of the idea of uh, hiring and uh, working are changing. Um, if you can. Uh, Business people like to pay by results. If I know that I can pay you a certain p amount of money and you're definitely going to deliver that product, then I'm happy. Because for me, it's easy. If I can sell it at a higher price, then I know I got a profit. Like, uh, like Frank d d uh, did, um, he just spent a lot of uh, time into the developing pro product by charging by time. But there's no way that I, sh I can know sure that it can come out. This is the problem. So coming back from uh, whether do I want to set up in Hong Kong or uh, global or anything, um, I hired talent from Philippines. Well, she is in she's she is sitting in Philippines, not not in, not in Hong Kong, uh, because Philippines is uh, right now one of the most good place for hiring English speaking virtual staff online because they are uh, Catholic uh, countries. So honesty is kind of good. Oh, just very quickly, I have no experience working for startups anywhere else. So uh, this is just based on talking to my employees. Um, what we found is that the, uh, it is quite difficult to find good programmers in Hong Kong. And actually, we had a very good intern that we liked and offered him a job. And then he joined Merrill Lynch IT department for <laughs> you know, twice, the, twice the salary. And then I always ask the question to the people I interview, you know, what do you want out of the job? And then they're, they're just really honest. They said, I want to buy my own place. I just want, I, I live in a cramped small home in Hong Kong. I want to make money so I can move out. And then they're, they're just very realistic. They're not like, I want to work for a startup. You know, it's cool. But then they just say, oh, you know, pay me well I, so I can be independent. So in Hong Kong, I think it's, it's uh, in, in that aspect, it's slightly difficult. Yeah, sorry, I got sidetracked by my 
comparison about the employment. Um, actually, the, the question to, to, to that question is that um, my business, uh, because it's service industry, uh, I need a place where a lot of small business can actually survive. Uh, I think Hong Kong is a fantastic place for a small company to survive, especially if you are in a more traditional uh, industry like a, tr uh, like a restaurant. Um, if you go to any r restaurant in uh, Central or Wan Chai, in lunchtime is packed. Basically, we have, we have, uh, but they are not good choices. By the way, <laughs> we have um, enough reasonably wealthy people in Hong Kong to make a lot of industry survive. So that's what I love about Hong Kong, and because of that, I can survive as well. have to make sure that you've done your work and sometimes uh, my um, technically I, I do my work quite um, fast but I do do some trade you know my boss asked me to do the work say um, I given them uh, time maybe per se I, I do I have done it early of course I'm not going to tell him I've done it already <laughs> I, I spend a day or two and okay I've done it already you know that's how you you know save some time from but you have to do the proper job um, and there are some tricks as well. If you can't do it um, on time, you can find someone to help you, pay them. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like um, there are some programs I have to do, and I, I'm really tired to do it. So I just, I, I, I have some people work around in China. So I ask them, uh, can you do that for me? I pay you a few hundred. And, okay, yes. And, and I don't have to work on it. So I, um, and. Of course, after I resign, my boss knows that. Yeah, so um, I think your concern is about the time you, you, you know, during the work. Um, but um, for the company I worked for, even in London or, or Hong Kong, i pretty quite free, actually. Yes. <laughs> for, for me, um, same case. So my boss didn't know uh, because I, I tried to hide it. I have two LinkedIn accounts and two emails. and. <laughs> I never share anything on my Facebook, and that's that's how I ha try to hide it. I'm glad that I quit it so that I can, you know, I don't have to do that. I combine my two LinkedIn accounts uh, so that oh, everybody just meet my. Um, but it's it's a valid point that um, there's a lot of difficulty. This is one of the difficulties if you hold a full-time job. Uh, my boss uh, told me that uh, you know, when the day I resigned, so he didn't know um, and. I don't find the point to let him know. Um, he's not gonna help my business, uh, and uh, he's not. I mean, you, you don't have the context. You, you just uh, let's see how you, how do you structure a company. If you're just an investor, that would be fine. Uh, this co-founder can be an investor too, but you just don't register as a director. Uh, so I don't I don't think there's a uh, complex here. Uh, but you spend time. But, but I, for me, I spend time in weekends and uh, night at the for the first couple of months, uh, and uh, just. Well, if you just do your good time job well, uh, I don't think it's a, it's a big problem. Um, just don't do, I mean, yeah, if you, but, but uh, when, you, when, you, when your business goes further and further, you'll find it difficult to balance both. Uh, so don't try to, don't think you have the ability to manage two jobs. Uh, you're going to screw up both at the end. So pick the right time and just focus on one. Um, hmm. It's difficult for my boss not to know because, first of all, I share everything on my Facebook WeChat account. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, my colleague has already penetrated into my organization. <laughs> uh, but I try to downplay it in front of my boss in telling them that this is just a hobby or like a hiking group or something I organize. It's not for profit, which is definitely not. And then I don't think they have a problem with that as long as I do my job. But uh, of course, you don't want to tell them that you want to become the next head or something. Then I think that will be a problem. I have a rather weird question, but I think it's related to the fact that I haven't started something properly. So have you thought about at what point you will get that, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to kill my business. Um, okay, to, to rephrase my question, I think it's equally an easy decision to make if your business is going very well or your business is not going, doing very well. Um, but 
but what if a business is just doing mediocre and you don't see a lot of upside or it's hard to see any upside? Um, you know, have you thought about, you know, at which point? I think I was just curious, I'll go with another idea or a little bit of um, just let me um, repeat the question again. Uh, in short, I, I'm sure some of you didn't hear that. Um, when do you give up, you know, if this is not going to work? So um, I think you need to ask yourself this question that if you have the same passion, you know, have the passion that to give it up even if you are, you know, struggling, um, how, how much love you are able to put in this project. But, uh, I mean, if, if you cannot persuade yourself this is going to, come, you know, um, to survive, I think um, properly you might have, I mean, for myself, uh, I tried different things before I started this project. And I, I do the research, I try, and I find out, you know, it's not going to work financially, um, first of all, financially. So um, when I know it's not going to financially to work, like um, the cash flow, you know, to make the business survive, I quit, I, I stop it. You know, it's, it's no point in doing it unless you have the passion. I mean, if I like piano, I, of course I can keep doing it because there's no financial risk, right? But if you want to start a business, and I mean, it's, there, there's just no future. Um, I, I, I did stop it. So um, I think you have to be, you know, very straightforward. Just you, you can't see the future. I think you have to stop it. Yeah. I mean, as an investor, you need to, you know, or unless you have a, you know, very wealthy family to support it. Yeah. I think it's a very, very difficult question. Um, it's not very easy to answer. I, I think that I, I'm split on this, actually. Uh, a part of me think of, I think, one of the speeches that Winston Churchill once gave. And the whole speech consisted of the words, never, 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 never give up. And part of me thinks, hey, if this thing doesn't work in two years, then, well, you know, why should I spend the rest of my life on something that doesn't generate money? So I think, I think that struggle is going to continue. There's not going to be a clear answer between the two, and then you just have to live with the, the struggle, and that's part of the startup experience. And then one day, when, when the time is right, you will know the answer and you know what to do. Um, I think there are too many unknowns in this in this world, and even more in the startup world. Just have to live with some unknowns before you start, and then work it out as you go along. I think this is a very good question. Um, my my. Uh, my strategy towards this question is to, I have also tried a lot of stuff, to, is to, uh, to try to find out what really don't work. Um, for example, your case, I don't know how, how far did you go, but if I want to open a uh, restaurant with uh, good, uh, tasty and healthy food, um, I need to confirm the idea that my friends or my market want tasty and healthy food. So if I, for example, I just provide 10 uh, lunchbox for my friends for free for a month, I will, I will see their feedbacks. Or uh, if this is good, then maybe it doesn't work out is because my location is bad or is my mar marketing message is not out yet. Um, if my foundation key, um, uh, if the foundation of my business, which people actually want healthy food, although they need it, they might not want it. If they don't want it, then it's not good market. But if they actually want it, just that a lot of other things are not met, I, I will work really hard. But if the foundation of my things, which I don't really believe in, then I'll probably give up quite quickly.
the world of year, the friend of the year, the month year, and then our children know that that they want to see So this is a great joy to come. It won't last for too long. It's going to last for too long. Thank you very much.